what must be done to save me. His love for me will never cease. And upon his hands he did engrave me with purest gold of thy grace. His will supreme I'll ever be. What pleases God that has pleased me. presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. Hear the good news. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all our sins. By the perfect life and his death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed our guilt forever. You are his own, dear child. May God give, give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. 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 Things which are profitable for us. 
We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Congregation, may be seated for our first reading. The first scripture reading for this eighth Sunday after Pentecost is found recorded in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. The Holy Spirit, by means of his own intercession, will help strengthen believers in their time of weakness until they reach their time of glory. We read God's word. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So far, first reading. Let's rise and join in singing Psalm 146 on page 41 in our worship supplement. <laughs> tells us the first separ- the final separation of believers from unbelievers will come about on Judgment Day. That is like not pulling up weeds with the wheat, but waiting for the harvest. Then the weeds will be gathered to be burnt, and the wheat is gathered and put into the barn. The picture of the judgment of hell and of heaven. The judgment will come, but not prematurely, to be according to God's timing. We read God's word. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares, the weeds, also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, 
First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So far, my gospel reading. Blessed are they that hear the word of God, keep it. Hallelujah.
Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning's meditation and application to our daily faith life is found recorded in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 44, verses 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. And who can proclaim as I do? Let him declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show these to them. Do not fear, nor be afraid, for I have told you from that time and declared it. You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. So far as one text. You may be seated. In Christ Jesus, our rock in whom we trust, dear fellow redeemed. Last Sunday we asked, how safe do people feel today? Well, there's a term that is used for people who feel quite safe and quite secure. The term is rock solid. If you have a rock solid friend, that person is one who will be with you in good times and in bad times. You can rely upon him for most every need. Hopefully, you have a rock solid marriage. One that's based and founded upon Christ's forgiving love and God's word. Hopefully you also have a rock solid future financial investment program that will withstand the upheavals and the ups and downs of the stock market. But even more we pray that all of you put your faith and your trust in your rock solid Lord and Savior. And that's what Isaiah is telling us in our text today. He says, the Lord is our rock. His first point is, he is rock solid in his care for us. In chapters 40 to 44 of Isaiah, the Lord is saying that in spite of the unfaithfulness of his people, he remains ever faithful. He chose them as his children. He promised them any blessings. And in this first verse of our text, verse 6, he assures his people that there is no one like him in regard to his care for them. Therefore, there is no need for trembling, for fear, or being afraid. In that first verse, verse 6, the Lord uses six different names for himself to show how much he cares for us. Lord, King, Redeemer, Lord of hosts, first and last, and God. And in verse 8, he called himself a rock. In those names, we see God's rock-solid care for all of us. First name, Lord. We know that as Jehovah. The I am who I am God, which represents and signifies the covenant God, the God of the promise of grace and mercy and compassion and forgiveness and everlasting life through the Messiah. It's like a name, king. Yes, the king rules, but even more importantly, a king goes to battle in defense of and for the sake of his people. And so what did our king do? Our king went to battle against our enemies. Our greatest enemy, Satan. Our king crushed Satan's power over us through his death on the cross and resurrection. He took away the power of Satan, sin, by removing our sin. He paid the punishment of sin, death. And by his separation from his father on the cross, he also endured damnation for you and for me. By his death and suffering, he gave us life and peace with the Father. And oh yes, he does also still rule over us. But he rules us with love with his words of love. 
Third name, Redeemer. A Redeemer is one who purchases or sets a person free with a cost, a ransom, a price. This is what the Lord said when he said he was going to redeem Israel from Egypt. He said, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from the, under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. That word redeem is used 24 times by Isaiah between chapters 40 and 66. The word redeem shows God's activity, his action. He's doing something for us people who willingly sold ourselves into slavery by our sinfulness, by our rebellion. As you know, Jesus redeemed us. Jesus redeemed us from sin, death, and the power of the devil and hell with the greatest ransom price ever. His life. His very body and blood upon the cross. We are brought back and set free forever. Fourth name, Lord of hosts. The Lord has the hosts of angel armies together with all that's created in heaven and earth at his disposal. The Lord of hosts literally means he's the Lord Almighty. The Lord All-Powerful. That's why he can care for each of us. Fifth name, first and last. Our God is everlasting. Without a beginning, without an end, even before he began the world, he was already there. And when he comes to end the world in all of history and time, he'll be there again to recreate a new heaven and a new earth where we'll live with him eternally. And the last name, God. Hebrew, Elohim, a plural form. The Lord alone is worthy of that name, God. Luther writes, A God means one from which we are to expect all good, and to which we are to take refuge in all distress. Our triune God alone is the one who is the essence of all good, and he alone is the one who can give us refuge in all of our distresses. He's the only God that exists. More on that in point three. So, point one again, our God is rock solid in his care for us. Isaiah's second point is, he is rock solid in his prophecies. We read in verse 7, And who can proclaim as I do? Let, then let him declare it and set it in order for me. Since I appointed the ancient people, and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show these to them. In this verse, the Lord assures his people that there is no one like him in regard to his promises and his prophecies that he made with his people. Not only has he taken care of us in the past, and promised to do so in the future, he even can foretell for us what will happen in the future. He alone can predict what will take place. Our God alone foretells what's going to happen, and then he performs it. Can any God created by human hands do that? No. All the false gods of this world are mute, and silent concerning future events. Our God is 100% correct when predicting the future. He never makes a mistake, never has, and he never will. He says his prophecies are sure even to the ancient times, even to Adam and Eve in the beginning of time in the Garden of Eden. He prophesied and promised them, you eat of this fruit, the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and rebel against my command, and you will surely die. And they did. Satan lied and said, oh, you will not surely die. You'll be like God. And then God made another prophecy. He said that there will be a seed of the woman, a descendant from Eve, who will come and crush the serpent's head. And even though the devil spent the rest of his time between that time and Jesus coming to try and stop that from happening, 
he couldn't do it. Because in the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son into this world to come and live a perfect life, to die upon the cross to pay for our sins, to rise from the dead and crush Satan's authority and power over all of us. We read in the scriptures, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. You see what God is doing in this seventh verse? He's actually issuing a challenge. He's saying, is there anyone in the past who has had a 100% record in predicting the future? Let him speak. Is there anyone who wants to try his hand at predicting the future and be 100% correct? Let him speak. God has. He's proved it. He's proved in his word. He's proved in history. In Deuteronomy 18, the Lord speaks about the true and false prophets. He says, But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has spoken? He answers, When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken, the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. In other words, if a prophet says, the Lord says, and it doesn't happen, he's false. Because the Lord says, and it's fulfilled, He's a true prophet. Because everything God prophesies comes to pass. Third point, God is rock solid in his claim as the only God. We read verse 8. Do not fear, nor be afraid, nor be trembling. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. The Lord now applies all that he has been saying to us. There's no need for trembling. There's no need for fear. They, of Isaiah's day, and we, have witnessed to the accuracy of all of God's prophecies, of all of God's promises. We've witnessed fulfillment of those promises. We witness the fulfillment of his care for us, even though we've sinned day after day after day after day and deserve none of God's grace, none of God's mercy and forgiveness. Yet every day he gives it to us through his son, Jesus. So God says, Is there a God besides me? I know not one. Our triune God alone is the rock. I decided to look up and find out when was the first time that God was called a rock. First time? Moses did it. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, Moses said, He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. There are 14, at least 14 references in the Psalms concerning God being a rock. Many of them from David. Two of them are from David. In Psalm 18, verse 2, David writes, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. In Isaiah 62, 2, he writes, He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Jesus proclaimed that he and his word is that rock. In Matthew 7, 24 and 25, Jesus says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, 
The floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. It did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. And finally, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, speaking of the Old Testament children walking through the wilderness, says this about Jesus, And all drank that same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. When the flood of troubles arise and roars as a mighty river, trying to wash us away, the only thing we can cling to is the rock. He remains ever firm, he remains ever steadfast. The waters may swirl all around him, but this rock, Jesus, provides safety and security for every single one of us in the midst of surging troubles and trials and temptations because he alone has come to save us. He alone has come to redeem us. He alone has said, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the world. There is no other rock. He alone has redeemed and saved us. He alone protects and cares for us. He alone perfectly prophesied all things from the future and has fulfilled all of them. We need to hear these words of encouragement again and again, especially in these days of turmoil. Don't be afraid. Do not fear. Don't tremble. Our confidence, our trust is in the Lord, our King, our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty, the first and the last, Elohim, God, and our rock. Apart from Him, no security, no safety, no redemption, no salvation exists. Because apart from our God, there is no other God. And there is no salvation. Praise alone be to our triune God of our salvation, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Ms. Rice. The peace of God which passes all our understanding will keep your hearts and minds centered in our rock, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>
together in prayer. O most merciful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you fill heaven and earth with your presence and reign over every creature with your power and glory. We thank you for your word, which enables us to know and worship you as our creator and our benefactor, our redeemer from sin, and our sanctifier, our Lord, and our rock. We also thank you for the many everyday personal evidences of your loving and watchful care for us. Truly, you alone are our God. All glory, honor, and praise to you now and forever. Our Heavenly Father, continue to love, preserve, and defend us. Guard us from the wicked attacks of our foe, the devil. Help us resist the temptations of the world in our own flesh. In spite of our sinful and stubborn natures, do not forsake us, but keep us as your dear children all our days. Accept the prayers we send to your throne of grace through Jesus, your Son, and answer our prayers. According to your gracious good will, allow us to live out our days in good health and bring us to find continual safety under your protection. Our Savior Jesus Christ, cover our sins with your shed blood and hide them forever from your sight. Fill our hearts with joy and may our inmost being experience the peace and the calm that comes from sins forgiven. Take our prayers to the Father and as our advocate, speak on our behalf. As our head, direct us always to do what is right and pleasing to God. As a source of our righteousness and salvation, fill us with contentment and keep our minds uncluttered by the riches, the cares, the worries, and the doubts of this world. The Holy Spirit, our divine helper, keep us faithful to your word, and through that word, feed our souls on Christ, the living bread. Strengthen our faith day by day. Make us fully committed to bearing fruits of righteousness to the honor and praise of your name. Purify us from all pride and self-righteousness, and teach us to rely alone on the sacrifice of Jesus for everlasting life. O Holy Trinity, the only true God, accept our praise and hear us always when we pray. We ask this for Jesus' sake. As we join together in praying the confident prayer our Savior taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. We'll continue with the next hymn. Mm -hmm.
receive with believing hearts the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give to you his peace. <laughs>